In this episode, Mike discusses the story and inspiration behind his painting, A Raven's Call. And Mike takes his creativity into the kitchen and shows us his inspired creation, wild boar blood orange tacos. The story behind this painting that I've entitled A Raven's Call is kind of multifaceted. There's several elements to it. First, the background scene and really why I decided to paint the painting in the first place is my good friend Chris Wright and I went out plein air painting alongside Long Valley Creek and there's these very interesting cliffs that are about 12 feet high. They're not really cliffs, but they're, they're hard banks of the, that the river carves out in the spring when it runs much faster. And I've always been fascinated with them and I've always wanted to paint them. And so I did this plein air piece with Chris of that location. Chris decided to set up real, really close to one of these cliffs and back in, in behind some sagebrush and he was back there painting and he had himself this, this little spot, which was fine. And I was in front of him in painting the, the bank that I, cho I just chose. I wanted to really crop in on the bank and, and paint that. And I did, and, and so I took a risk and I feel as though the risk paid off. Uh, I was really happy with the painting. And Chris had, I had stepped back to take a look at Chris's work, which was also really very nice, nicely done. And Chris had stepped out to look at my work. And in the process, I was gonna help Chris bring some of his things out from behind the sagebrush in preparation to go. And so I grabbed his, uh, painting kit or something, I don't remember, but as I was coming out from behind this sagebrush with it, I noticed Chris like just taking a dive, this heroic dive uh, to save my umbrella because my the wind had come up and my uh, everything blew over. My easel blew over, my painting ended up face down in the weeds and my umbrella was headed over the cliff. Chris didn't realize that I had it tethered and um, any, anyway, ended up only losing one piece of it over the edge, which we went down and retrieved later. But, um, so the, the plein air piece now is kind of subdued. Some of the details uh, went away. So I thought, well, I've got the photography I took while I was out here. I've got this plein air piece for reference. I really would like to paint this back in the studio and paint it larger. And as I was contemplating that, I thought, you know, that's, that's a fun little painting, but it needs, needs a center of interest. And so I decided that I wanted to put a raven as the center of interest. And so I, I did a little uh, study of a raven. And then I knew that between these two, I could go ahead and come up with the larger painting. And so the larger painting is 22 by 28, I believe. And the story behind the raven is this. The question may arise as to what was my inspiration for putting the raven in this painting. And let me tell you, it's I, I love that bird because when I hear its call, it reminds me of places like this and places like the bank of the Long Valley Creek where that painting was originally painted. And the reason it does is because the, the caw of the raven reminds me, the croak, the croak of the raven reminds me of the remote areas of Nevada like this. And that's one of the reasons why I love to come out here, because when you come out here, it's definitely silent. It's so refreshingly silent. 
There's no white noise. There's no airplane sounds. There's no highway sounds. There's no sounds except for that of the gentle breeze and occasionally the croak, the croak of the raven. You hear that? I love it. I love it. And so that was my inspiration for the raven next to Long Valley Creek. So people ask me a lot of times, where do I get inspiration? Inspiration can come from anywhere. Inspiration relative to painting or anything else comes from when something catches my attention. Something catches my attention and I begin to think about it and I begin to think, how can I create something around that? And so my inspiration spreads beyond the studio and this is like my second studio. So I just want to share with you a completely untested recipe. It will be tested by the time you watch this because I will have eaten some of it. But I want to tell you kind of how the process hit me. So I'm walking through the grocery store the other day and I see a display of blood oranges. Now, I don't know if it's seasonal or if they just put them in because it's getting close to Halloween and blood oranges sounds really scary. But I saw this display of blood oranges and I thought, what can I do to make something delicious and very, I was just inspired to make something with blood oranges. I'm gonna make blood orange wild boar tacos. And so let's just see how this comes out because follow along, I'll show you my idea and at the end of, of the video, um, I'll give you the recipe. So I have about a half a pound of uh, ground wild boar that I have previously cooked. So my ground wild boar is ready to go. It's uh, like I said, about a half a pound. And then over here are my other ingredients. I have my blood oranges, of course. I'm gonna use the juice from two of them. And then we're gonna use some of the slices. Over here, I have some red pepper, green onions. I have some diced up sweet potatoes and I have some garlic of course and then I also have some of these hatch green chili tortillas that I think are going to be really good to make these tacos with so let's go ahead and get started so the first thing I want to do is juice these two of these I want to get the juice from two of these blood oranges and I really don't, I need one of those little, I need one of those little devices for juicing citrus, but I don't have one. So we're just gonna do it the messy way. And see what happens. What I wanna do is I wanna get enough juice that I can reduce it a little bit, make it a little thicker. I don't want it to be just juice. And I may end up, I think I'm gonna add it to some reduced balsamic vinegar, just to give it some, I want it to have some, some body, some texture. And I've got some balsamic vinegar that's in a reduction that's pretty thick and I think that'll work out fine. So I've got a, the juice from about two, from two of these, which is about, mm, not quite a half a cup, but let's just say for the sake of the recipe, it's a half a cup. On a medium high heat, I'm just gonna reduce this down. So I'm gonna give that a few minutes to come to a boil and 
then we'll see how far we can reduce it and thicken it up. I've got that boiling nice now, so it's been about three minutes. Just let that boil for about three minutes. That's, it's looking pretty reduced, getting down there um, real close. So I'm gonna say boil that for three to four minutes until it's reduced down about halfway. Now that I have that reduced down, I'm gonna get what I can out of the pan here. Pour it in, back into my cup. Got it reduced down to probably about a quarter of what it was. And then, so I'm just going to add to that a little bit of this balsamic glaze. Um, this is just some balsamic, this is balsamic vinegar, vinegar glaze. And I'm gonna add that as well. About probably a couple of, I'm gonna say about a tablespoon. That's how I measure in the kitchen. Perfect. Okay, now I've cleaned out my, my little uh, pot and it's ready for the next phase. So I'm gonna put this back on a medium, a medium heat, actually kind of a medium high because I don't want to, I'm gonna brown up my sweet potatoes. So you take a little butter, I'm gonna say a fat pat or a tablespoon of butter. And I use butter for this. I recommend to use butter instead of oil because butter is gonna help these uh, sweet potato squares to brown without having to overcook them. So I don't have to cook them for a really long time to get them brown and that's why I'm also cooking them on fairly high heat. I'm gonna let that butter melt up in the pan and then I'm going to go ahead and throw those in. This is gonna be about a cup, about. Now see this is going to feed two to three people. So you can adjust the recipe accordingly. It's, gonna, it's only gonna feed two in my household because I'm probably gonna end up making a pig of myself. So after about three to four minutes, you can kind of see that things are starting to brown here. They're really starting to brown well. So I'm gonna kind of flip them around and we're gonna keep them going for another three or four minutes. Keep your eye on it at this point because you could experience disaster in a short order if, uh, if you let this go unattended. It's pretty hot for the butter and it's browning out pretty quickly. You don't wanna burn these, but by the same token, you don't wanna get the uh, sweet potato too soft. You want some texture in there, at least I do. And total time on that's been about almost five minutes. So I'm gonna call that good. I like that just how it is. Now I'm gonna take the squash out and I'm gonna leave the butter in and I'll show you why. So I'm just carefully getting out the last of my squash and there's, there's just enough butter left in this pan that I'm gonna return it to the heat and then I'm going to saute some garlic. Go ahead and turn your heat down to medium to medium low, depending upon your burner. I would go air on the side of, of low. And then I'm going to go ahead and add some squished garlic to that. Let's take my garlic press and press out some garlic in there probably two garlic presses worth of cloves, depending on how big your cloves are. So that's gonna be about five or six cloves of garlic. Make sure you get that stirred around in the butter. And that's, our, that's still pretty hot, the pan is still pretty hot. So this garlic is just, we're just gonna let that, take that off the heat and let the garlic absorb the rest of that butter. 
And I think I'm just going to add just a touch of olive oil to that. And let that garlic continue to toast. And I'll show you what I'm going to do with that garlic. Now, don't worry if you've made too much garlic and oil. You can never, one, you can never have too much garlic. But two, you can also save some of this. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this toasted brown garlic into a cup. And then to that, I'm going to add about a decent sized tablespoon of, oil, of uh, mayonnaise and mix that all together. And just like that, you kind of have an instant aioli sauce. Now, I've been guilty of making a mess in the kitchen um, pretty much every time I cook, but I'm gonna attempt to keep it down to a minimum and not make too big of a mess. So now it's time to assemble the filling for our tacos. And so um, I'm gonna just transfer this ground wild boar into my other little pot here. It has a little bit higher edges and hopefully won't make quite as big of a mess. Take your browned a sweet potato and put that in with the ground pork. And then we're also going to take the fresh red pepper. And we're not cooking this pepper at all. We're just gonna put it in there nice and stout. And I'm gonna say, let's put in about a half a cup as well. So I've gotta chop some more and put that in. And then go ahead and put in a chopped green onion as well. And I may end up adding a little more than that, but for now, let's just say one green onion. And then go ahead and mix that together nicely, all nice and homogenized. Okay, so I peeled three blood oranges and these things sometimes don't peel quite so easily. And so I didn't do a very dainty job. As a matter of fact, that one is just gonna get eaten right now. Mm. Okay, so what I wanna do with these slices is to cut them up into smaller chunks. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do that and add that to my assembly as well. So you might encounter a seed or two when you're slicing up these slices, and if so, just discard them. They, there shouldn't be too many seeds. Blood oranges don't typically have too many seeds that I'm aware of. These ones didn't. So anyways, just add the chopped up, diced up slices from two blood oranges into your mix. And then make that nice and homogenous. And I'm probably, this has cooled down quite a bit. I'm probably just gonna heat it up just a tad to release a little bit of the juice from those oranges. I don't want it real juicy, but I wanna have that juice spread around in there to get that flavor spread throughout the filling. So I'm just putting it on a medium heat for probably a minute or two is all, I'll stir it around and try to release a little bit of the juice from those orange slices. And I think while that's happening, I'm gonna go to the cupboard and hunt down some, a little bit of chipotle, um, just to add a little, a little heat to the sweet. So I'm just gonna add a little bit of chipotle, about a quarter of a teaspoon. Back in the day, um, I would have added a lot more heat, but you know, getting a little older and my tolerance for that sort of thing uh, 
kind of waning. So we won't add too much heat, just a little. Add as much as you like though. If you like something very spicy, you can always add more. You could also add a little, and I just may do it, a little smoked paprika just to give a little, little more flavor to that little, all that intense flavor we already have. You could actually uh, pump it up even just, take it a little bit more to the next level. Um, if you're not adding as much chipotle, add a little smoked paprika. That'll give that smoky flavor that the chipotle has without the heat. And I'm going to say that is just about ready to be put on a taco. Okay, time to, time to taste it before we put it in our, take the final step and put it in our taco. That's really excellent. It needs just a little bit of salt, not too much. Maybe, I don't know, a few cranks from your salt grinder. I don't know how much that, I don't know. That's about a shake or two out of a regular salt shaker. And let's uh, mix that around. Give it another try. That's gonna be really good. A little garlic, put some cheese on there. And then instead of cilantro, I think I'm gonna put a little bit of arugula in there. So this is like a, just a flavor bomb, but good. Okay, so here we are on the final leg of our culinary journey have these nice little uh, green chili, hatch green chili tortillas. A little bit small, but I'm gonna make it work. So I just gotta heat up my tortilla on, I'm just gonna use a smaller burner and I'm gonna just do it old school, right on top of the burner, lay that on there. Let that go for about, I don't know, until you start seeing little wisps of smoke or you set off your smoke alarm or something. About like that, looks good. Turn it over. Oh man, this is gonna be good. Okay, so I'm gonna put this thing together. We're gonna do the tortilla. A little bit of that aioli sauce on there. A nice scoop of filling. Some cheese. That's just grated mild, grated mild cheddar. And then my redu reduction sauce. A little of that on there. And then we'll just top that off with just a tiny bit, a couple of pieces of arugula. Let's taste that. All what I've been waiting for. Try these, you will love them. That's awesome. I'm gonna get a glass of wine and finish this off. Because of the intensity of the flavor of this, I'm going to pair it with a, a bold Cabernet, something that's gonna be, be able to handle all those flavors, but is, is in it of itself not overpowering and not uh, too, too over the top. And so this is a nice Cabernet from the Lodi area and it pairs really well with this.
Slantja, and we'll see you next time for another food idea.